So my name's Tim Mackle, I am Chief Executive of Dairy NZ. A little bit about who we are. We are um, an industry good body uh, that is owned by all dairy farmers in New Zealand. So uh, we're actually a, a body that is enabled, if you like, by the Commodity Levies Act. So every farmer that produces milk solids then contributes a levy to Dairy NZ. And, uh, and so we, we actually have to go to farmers every five years, we're doing that next year, to, uh, to go and get their support to continue on for another five years. So that's how the whole system works. So we're largely funded by farmers. We invest around 90 million a year on their behalf. About 60 of that, a little bit over that, is from them. And the rest comes in through government sources uh, that we either utilise ourselves or we invest in others like our CRIs and so on. Um, so that's uh, how, how that whole system works. So what I want to talk today to you about though is really what's ahead for us on farm in New Zealand and some of the challenges that, and opportunities that we do have. So I will cover our strategy, uh, which we're calling Making Dairy Farming Work. You might need to turn that around please Nadine so I can see it too, thank you very much. And I want to uh, also um, so that's, that's the main thing today, is just to talk about challenge, some of the challenges we've got and then cover the strategy as well. So if we can move forward now, Dadeem. Why is it important? Let's touch on that first. Why is dairying so important to our economy? Well, on a regional basis, and we've got a, a very good economics team within Dairy NZ, and I know Sam sitting in the audience over there. Um, and they'll give me some figures here just to highlight to some of these key regions and also nationally how important it is. So in terms of GDP, which is really the money go around in, in the economy, it is a big contributor right across the nation. At, at uh, the Waikato alone, it's almost 10% of uh, GDP in this region. And at a national level, we can see there are 45,000 people employed, and that's really directly. There's a lot of indirect jobs as well, but that's in a direct sense, um, and those self-employed people. So really, the, on farm, there's a huge number of people there employed, and that's not counting all the others that are supporting farmers as well. In the Waikato, a lot, large number of jobs, and there's been a very strong, healthy growth since 2005. Um, so it is contributing very significantly to our economy, in spite of the GFC, which uh, we've all experienced in recent years. So from a national perspective, $5 billion contribution to GDP, and that's about $14 billion also in export receipts. It's bringing in about 27%, maybe 28% this year of all of our exports that we are earning for New Zealand. And if you count cull cows in the mix, which are cows that leave the farm and enter the beef industry, it would be over 30%. Uh, so you're getting towards a third of all of our exports comes from dairy farmers. It's a big number. So it's important. It's important to our economy, particularly uh, in regional economies like the Waikato, but also in Auckland as well. So it does matter to everyone, and, and I guess that's one of the key themes when we refreshed our strategy this time. We wanted to, to try and bring into the mix the fact that uh, getting this stuff right is important for all of us, not just for our dairy farmers. So that's a bit of a snapshot on that. Now if we took a look at some of the issues that we've been grappling with, we put out the last strategy uh, four years ago, and, and we're talking about a strategy for dairy farming, so it's largely aimed at the dairy farm, pre-farm gate. They are pretty important things because they firstly influence uh, the industry bodies on, on the important things they want to engage on. For us at Dairy NZ, it helps our board decide where they invest farmers' money and also where we look to try and leverage government investment as well. They're really important for our partners that help dairy farmers, the CRIs like Ag Research and the universities, Lincoln and Massey and so on, and shows them where they can hook into specific challenges and targets that we've got in a strategy. Uh, they're really important uh, from a government investment point of view, which I just touched on as well, and, and it's been really useful in the last four years in that context too. And above all, it's very important for farmers to be able to hold us all accountable, because these strategies have targets in them, which they can then uh, measure uh, us against in terms of the, the success that we deliver as well. So one of the key things I did want to make the point is that lots of people contribute to achieving this strategy, not the least farmers themselves in the main, because they're the ones that are out there having to deliver the results on the ground. Um, but you know there are a lot of commercial bodies, um, 
uh, the breeding companies like LIC and CRV, the fertiliser companies, Ravensdown Balance, got the universities I talked about, you've got CRIs and you've got all the other commercial entities as well that are out there supplying farmers and helping them as well. So this is not the seed companies as well, this is not a dairy NZ strategy. What we do is we take a role in helping facilitate that and as a custodian, if you like, on behalf of farmers. So um, it's a very important point. Everyone contributes to this. So what's happened in those last four years, I'd argue there haven't really been anything new in terms of trends that weren't there four years ago, but there's a bunch of things that have intensified, things that have got more important for us in that time frame. And in this country, water, water quantity, Water quality have been big things, obviously, that uh, have, I'd, again, I'd argue they've intensified in terms of their, their, their importance and their urgency over that time frame. The whole sustainability agenda, the environmental sustainability agenda, again, has grown momentum in that time frame. People and the importance of high-quality people on farm and near farm it was an issue four years ago and it continues to be a, a really big issue for us going forward and because farming is going to get a whole lot more complex going forward, the need for top quality people on farm as well as near farm supporting farmers is only going to increase. We did some modelling in fact in the last couple of years to try and understand how many, how many qualified people do we need going onto the farms themselves. So we think at the moment in terms of diploma and degree qualified people entering farms every year, going onto farms, not near farm, not, not doing a, a sales job or a technical role, but on the farm itself. It's been about 150 people a year. We think to, to actually hit our challenges and our targets as an industry, we need about 1,000 people going onto farms a year that are either diploma qualified or degree qualified. So that whole area of people has been a big uh, mover as well. The need to be uh, competitive is absolutely paramount. It always has been a hallmark of our industry and that's competitive obviously at home against other land users and also overseas. But I'd argue now it's more important than it ever has been because two things, one, we've got a lot more challenges ahead of us. Some of the regulatory things that we're facing now are gonna mean that we are gonna have to etch out more profit out of the system. And also, there are more competitors that are bubbling away and emerging overseas. And uh, because of those issues, we have to run faster than we ever have been. So they're really important. And lastly, I think the other big trend has been that the public and also our customers and consumers are having more of a say about how we farm and how we use our natural resources. And that is never going to go away. That thing's only going to become more of an issue, particularly if New as New Zealand targets the higher-end customers and around the globe, they're going to be more discerning. So that, that thing is intensified too, and so we uh, have, to, have, to, uh, have to respond to that. Now, we have a slide just sort of highlighting this issue here for us. So I have made that point that, uh, you know, we've got issues around customers <coughs> wanting more from their products and suppliers. Remember, at an ingredient level, I'm talking about customers. In terms of the consumers who are buying the stuff in the stores, they're wanting more transparency around how food is being produced. And as I said, back here at home, our communities are, are, are saying more about how we farm as well and getting more involved with their opinions. So we have to respond to them and we have to make the most of them. I argue as opportunities for us here in New Zealand and also to manage the risks that they do pose for us. Now this slide, this photo here is a photo of two chaps that came out from China. In fact, one came across from Sydney, the other from China, during the drought that we just experienced. It was about March, I think, and this major Chinese network got wind of the fact that we had a drought in New Zealand and thought, well, there might be a story here along the lines of, are we gonna get the same amount of infant formula supplied to our women in China, you know, and that could be newsworthy over there. So that's why they thought they'd come and cover it. Just highlights the, the fact that this stuff's of interest to people back in China, which is a good thing, but it also highlights the risk as well. They happened to um, fly into Auckland Airport one morning, and on the very same morning, if Nadine could just flick that slide for me, there was a photo on page three in the New Zealand Herald that showed what is described as a slaughterman putting a cow down in a paddock with a rifle. And I did open the paper up this morning, and I wasn't very happy, actually, I have to say. And they opened it up, then they drove from Auckland down to Hamilton, and 
and you've done the drive yourself, you know, there's not actually that many dairy herds until you get to about Taupri, and unless you go through Gordonton, for Carrion to Narrow Wahia, again, you don't see that many dairy herds. So they drove through Narrow Wahia and down through Hamilton and then out to Newstead to meet up with Bruce Thorold, our productivity strategy guy. And they met Fonterra the same day. They were coming to see Dairy NZ and Fonterra to do the story. And they, when they arrived, they, they asked Bruce, have we shot all the cows? And, uh, and you know, it took Bruce about 10 minutes to, to explain that this was just uh, the media, in this case taking a, a, ra a random photo and, uh, and trying to really make the point that things were tough out there. I don't think this was drought related at all, it was just a standard issue that goes on on farms from time to time. But the point is, we are farming in a goldfish bowl. And uh, that's the message we've been delivering to farmers around the country. Uh, and our customers are so much more attuned to what's happening here. And the dairy companies will tell you they find out very quickly from customers if something breaks in New Zealand. So um, that's, that's a trend that's, that's it's becoming more important and we have to respond to it. So if we move along now, I touched on competitiveness. This graph here, I don't want you to have to read if you, the, the, the y-axis, but I'll tell you what it says. On that vertical axis, it's the cost of milk production. It's converted into US dollars per 100 kilograms of milk. So it's a standardised cost on on farm, on farm cost. On that horizontal axis, and on the bottom, we have export volume. So essentially, this is all the traded milk across the world that's going on. It's about 50 billion odd litres, and we are doing about 18 or 19 billion litres in New Zealand. So you can see that in terms of width of the bars, New Zealand in the green is fairly, fairly broad, which just highlights the fact that we are a large exporter of all of that traded dairy product. But in terms of cost, you can also see that we're no longer the lowest cost producer. And so there are a number of other countries that are to the left of us, which is the position that we once held. But we don't hold that anymore, so we can no longer claim that we are the lowest cost producer. But the good thing is we're still the lowest cost producer at scale. Uh, and that's a position we have to hold on to quite dearly. Our economists, Sam and, and Matt and our people at DRNZ, have worked out that for competitiveness in terms of profitability, while we export about a third of the world's dairy traded products, we're enjoying about two thirds of the profits from that trade that's going on. And that's largely because, because areas and countries like the EU countries plus the US and so on, when they're exporting, they are often exporting at a loss uh, because of subsidies supporting them. So uh, we have that good, strong position, but the key thing is we can't let go of it because if we do, we start to spiral downhill. And so it's a really important position to hold as enjoying a good number of the profits. And that's because the price band sits just above that New Zealand sign up there where the price oscillates between. And we're actually quite close to it, so there's not a lot of headroom there. We've got to be very careful. And just to highlight that, again, our team have, have shown that large-scale milk producers in the US in this black bar here in California, two, 3,000 cow farms, are pretty much as competitive on a cost basis as our large farms in New Zealand. So it's not actually enough just to say the US is, is up here. It's actually you've got to unpick the actual producers and what state they're in and the system that they're using it. And because often it's those farmers in California that might actually contribute to, to more exports. So we're going to be careful. We're going to be very careful. It's a, it's a good position to be in, but if we let go of it, it'll be to our peril. So what's going on underneath that competitiveness? Well, the big thing is profit, and that's what we've got to really drive hard on is profit. And this graph here shows you from our dairy base, database in Dairy NZ, which has now got about 2,500 owner-operators in it, so it's got a good number. It shows the farm working expenses. So this is or operating expenses. This is the costs on farm shown in a per kilo of milk solids basis over on that y-axis there. And you can see, I've drawn a, a red circle around 2007, 8 that at that point it jumped up a lot. We had that, the, the big drought in 07, 08, and that was the year just before the recession hit, October 2008. We had very high on-farm inflation. The nation went up about 4.2%. On-farm costs went up about 11%. Energy costs, fuel, fertiliser, everything went up. And the biggest mover, though, in that time it was feed costs, feed-related costs. And you can see that since we jumped up then, we haven't come back down. 
And so we've added almost a dollar to our, to our operating cost during that period. And we think that's a bit of a concern. If you look at the milk price, luckily the green bar has jumped up too during that period and that's been the saving grace. So that in spite of the fact farm working expenses went up, we managed to maintain a margin because thankfully milk price went up too. But we can't rely on that because we know we're in a, an export uh, world and that volatility is here to stay and that sometimes we're going to have to breathe in when milk price drops. Fortunately next season things are looking a lot more positive and optimistic but we can't always count on that. So this is a concern to us uh, in spite of the fact that milk price has been up there we've got to watch this one here. And on top of that the bottom point there just shows that while we went up during that five year period in farm working expenses the average cost of debt servicing to those farmers on dairy base also went up by 70 cents a kilo. So you add 70 cents to about 90 and you get into a dollar 60 of extra cost going on during that time. Do you mind if we just um, hold the questions? That are right? I'll try and get through and then we'll do them at the end. Right, so moving along to the next slide there. Another way to look at risk of our farmers is to plot the interest cost, which I just talked about, interest and rent from leases and so on, against that farm costs, the farm working expenses along the bottom there. And our guys have gone and put a red line on, on this to show that for the year that we're in now, which we're thinking milk price 580 is the still the indicative uh, price for the forecast for this year. This is a forecast, remember, where we end up at the end of it. Uh, and then you add stock sales and things on top of it, and you'll get to just above that $6 plus the value add component for most farmers. You'll get to over that $6 figure. Anyone above that line will finish the year making a loss because they can't meet the costs of farm working expenses and interest as well with what they're earning. We thought at the start of the year a $5.50 forecast that 25% of our farmers would be in that position, potentially. That's at $5.50. Uh, obviously the, the milk price and the value add will go up much higher than that now, higher. But for farmers in this region and others that have been affected by the drought, they've, they've had a double whammy of higher feed costs and also lost milk production. So we think it could be as high as 40% of North Island farmers now end up in that situation. Canterbury farmers on the other hand ended up 8% up this year that's just finished. So it's a, it's a real uh, regional issue. So the point is, this is a good way of looking at potential risk on an annual basis. But the other way to look at it is the operating profit per hectare. And, and the good thing is really that there is still huge potential out there for, for the, a good majority of our farmers in terms of lifting their operating profit. And I say that because if you look at farms that are operating at this end of the spectrum where they're earning some up to $6,000 operating profit per hectare, uh, there is a lot of potential. We've got this nice bell curve here for 11, 12, and it's the same curve every single year. And our goal is to get a lot more farmers from the left-hand side of this curve to this side of the curve. So a lot of the work that we do at Dairy NZ and partners is very heavily focused on shifting and helping farmers move to this end of the curve. And I'll, I'll say now, it's not about system necessarily because what our database shows is that at any system, low input, medium input or high input, you can have that same curve. You have the same spread. You have farmers that are making no money, and you have farmers that are making a lot of money. So it, it all comes down ultimately to skill and to decisions that are made on the farm. That is the biggest driver our analysis has shown that determines the spread of this curve. Right, moving along. But how have we done? How have we actually done in the last little period? Well, we've got a, a, a measure called Profit from Productivity, and we developed it at Dairy NZ, and it, it really uh, has four main drivers. It's the feed grown, the feed utilised, the costs that, that are used on the farm, and labour use efficiency. And, and, it, and it shows how well a farm's doing in any one year from getting better, from being more efficient. And what we can tell you that if we use 99 as a base year, that the actual average farm in 99, sorry, uh, compared, today compared to 99, $1,500 per hectare. Uh, so what that means is that if you were the average farm in 1999, 
and you were average at that point, in the middle of that bell curve that I just showed you, that if you didn't get the efficiency gains that we have seen on farm across the country, you'd be now sitting in the bottom 15%. So in other words, the, that bell curve has continued to move to the right for all farmers, which is a good thing, and so we are seeing gains in efficiency. And so there is some good progress that has been made since 99. Um, it's just the argument is there are a lot of farmers who are sitting still at the left-hand side of that bell curve, and we need to get them to enjoy much more of that profit as well. And that'll underpin our competitiveness going forward. Right, on to the strategy now. So, so that's some of the context, if you like, that, that, that drives us in formulating the strategy. We'll put a strategy together uh, with some partners. If you can just go back, please, Nadine. And those partners uh, in here are Federated Farmers Dairy. We've got Decans, which is the Dairy Companies Association of New Zealand. And then we've brought Dairy Women's Network into the mix as well to, to contribute. And we've been working on this for uh, about almost 12 months now, engaged with farmers in, in, in several occasions to get good feedback and input into it. We're starting with a, a line that, that says making dairy farming work for everyone. I said earlier on why that's important. We want everyone to to get a sense for what our challenges are, as well as the opportunities, and that way we think we've got the best chance of success. So what does it mean? Well, it means two things to us. It means being competitive in global sense and locally, and it means being responsible. And we believe those two things will lead to what we're calling sustainable dairy farming. So the strategy is about sustainable dairy farming. We're saying that's three things, sustainable dairy farming. It's, it's the... It's the uh, economic sustainability, it's social, or community, and it's environmental. And we've deliberately put the word into the strategy because although a lot of people don't like the word sustainability, we think we should be defining what it means for us as a dairy farming industry. And so that's those three things, economic, social, and environmental. So on this competitive side of the ledger, we've got farm profit first, and that's the number one thing farmers want us to have in the strategy up front for the reasons I just showed you in the last few slides. Very key. A lot of work in here already. A heavy benchmarking focus, which things like dairy base I just showed you can support. The next one is research and development. This is the number one thing that farmers tell us they want from our levy investment and from government investment every year. And that to me reflects the psyche that our farmers in New Zealand have of continuous improvement. They always want to improve. It's how we've got to be where we are. And they're wanting new knowledge and things that they can fold into their business and get better. The next one's talented people, that's uh, skilled, upskilling them, it's retaining them and, and so on. And there are a lot of people working in this space right now. Because remember what I said earlier on, this is not a Dairy NZ strategy per se, this is a strategy for dairy farming and lots of different organisations and people are contributing to that. Biosecurity and product integrity is the next one and we would argue in terms of our competitiveness, this has always been a competitive advantage and it must continue to be so in the future. Uh, so biosecurity, it's, it's a big priority with our current Minister for Primary Industries, um, with our industry and lots of people will again contribute to that. Dairy companies themselves, MPI and of course farmers for example. Product integrity is a phrase we've put in there. We haven't called it food safety for the very reason that it's broader than food safety. And we've seen that with a recent DCD issue in the market. It wasn't a food safety issue. It was, an, it was a perception issue, which is really more about the, the perceived integrity of the food as opposed to an actual food safety issue. So we've got to understand that now. It's more than food safety. So food safety is, is one of our pillars. It's why we've got such a great reputation but it comes, it comes in broader than that eventually. It's about, it's about actually about your, your, the perceptions of, of our food and, and how we produce it and its safety as well. So again, a very key area that we're going to be working on going forward. The last one is a thing called industry information systems. These are things that farmers need, but they can't do by themselves. So we've got examples like the Animal Evaluation Limited, which generates BW on bulls, and that's a subsidiary of Dairy NZ. We have got um, the Dairy Industry Good Animal Database we're working on with LOC at the moment to, um, to take that into a new phase. Forage Value Index we launched last year with the seed companies together with the seed companies. Another good example of, of, a, of a system that, that we believe we need. It wasn't being done commercially, so we had to be in there in a catalytic role working with the commercial entities. On the other side, environmental stewardship is the first big ten of the 10 objectives, or five on this side. 
And that's about wise use of, of natural resources, of land and water and so on. And our biggest play there is the new Sustainable Dairy and Water Accord, which we did do a soft launch with farmers back in March, and, and now we're about to launch it officially in July. Difference this time round is that all dairy farmers are going to be engaged on this water accord, not just Fonterra farmers. Dairy and Dead's playing a bigger uh, key role in terms of facilitating this. Uh, we have got some uh, a structure around committing parties at the core who are doing a lot of the work, farmers most importantly, supporting parties which will all have a, a key contribution. And then there's friends of the accord around the outside and, and regional councils, have, most of them have signed up to that. And that's about others saying, well look, this is a good thing, we endorse it and we support it. So there's a slightly different emphasis. The uh, key things last time were nutrient management, effluent management and keeping stock out of water. They're still there, we've added to it water use efficiency, conversions, some new rules around bringing new conversions and something that regional councils are actually doing themselves. And lastly, farms having a riparian planting plan by 2020. So they are the new elements to the new accord. That's the biggest play in here. The next one is animal welfare. This is about lifting standards where they need to be lifted and there's a code that MPI hold, which is the thing we need to adhere to on the farm. It's about doing research to help define what good is in our context. And also it's about defending our core business. We've got a very unique farming system here and we've got to make sure that we can continue to do the things we do in a sensible way um, without having things imposed upon us that don't actually fix anything or help anything. So there's three big elements there. The next one is work environment. It goes hand in hand with talented people. What kind of work environment on the farm should we be aspiring to and achieving? Farmers need to drive that one. Local communities is another one here which is actually quite new in, in our strategy in terms of putting that in. It's recognising that farmers uh, need local communities to help support them and vice versa. Dairy farming is playing a big role around the country in sustaining local communities economically but also you know, in the community. So farmers are heavily involved, board of trustees, coaches of sports teams, all those kind of things, fire brigade. And that's all important and we need to keep sustaining that. At a high level there's also the connect with the New Zealand public uh, and so there are things like Fonterra Milk for Schools and Dairy and Z's Go Dairy Education program. We've been to 1,200 odd teachers of the 2,500 schools. Uh, Rosie the Cow, hopefully you'll see her at the field days. Those kind of things. Fed Farmers Open Days, all good examples of things that contribute to connecting with the local communities, helping get more support for what we're trying to do. And the last one is a thing called National Prosperity. That again is a new one in our strategy and this one really uh, highlights the fact that we believe we've got a responsibility to actually contribute more to New Zealand in an economic and in a social sense, not just to our farmers. So embedded in this particular objective is a lot of work going on right now around the country with regional councils as they develop land and water plans to launch them for consultation in October. And we're in there heavily involved, uh, Dairy NZ, and our partners, the likes of Fonterra and dairy companies, and also fed farmers as well, and others. So there's a lot of work that has to be done here in terms of making sure that we get the right political framework, right regulatory framework that helps fix issues and address things, but at the same time supports sustainable growth of our industries. And we're doing a lot of economics. Uh, which our team, Sam and co, are involved in with other organisations to help support that as well. So that's the strategy. Now I want to finish just with one slide now. Uh, I talked a lot at this last one about national prosperity and some of that work there around regional councils, land and water plans that are, that are various stages of, of kicking off and starting to be developed. What's Driving that is the national policy statement on fresh water that the government put out in about 2011, I think it was. And this national policy statement does a couple of things. It, it does require regional authorities, regional councils to, to develop these plans for their regions uh, along a certain timeline. And the impacts of, of the policy changes and the measures have to take place out to 2030, so it's quite a long run thing. One of the features is that it, it actually requires a community-based approach to setting the targets, which we actually support in the dairy industry because we think that you, you need the community around a water body, for example, to actually decide, well, do we want it to be clearer? Do we want it to swim in it? And so on, and what's our aspiration? What's possible? 
So that's a good thing. However, there is risk to us because not only dairy but all agriculture, we're our minority uh, and, and we know that. So we've got to be very active in this space to make sure that we get the right outcomes for everybody.